name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So I vowed only to take a couple minutes of your time because the gospel uh, was particularly long today, but it is too rich to pass up. Uh, we've had several rich gospels in a row, and this is called uh, the catechumenate or the teaching uh, set of gospels uh, for Lent. Uh, and John has taken us through some of the uh, real rich layered stories of the gospel from uh, Nicodemus coming in the middle of the night uh, because something inside of him believes in the truth of who Jesus is, uh, but he knows that if he fully uh, gives himself over to that truth, it changes everything, uh, and he's reluctant to give up his birthright and his power. Uh, and then the next week we have uh, the woman at the well uh, who has nothing to lose and uh, who is uh, considered the farthest thing from a holy person, uh, yet somehow understands uh, Jesus in a way that very few, if anybody else, does and has the longest exchange uh, we've ever encountered with, uh, with somebody in Jesus and becomes a, a disciple. Uh, today we have the story of the blind man who sees more clearly than just about anybody uh, uh, in in the story, and then next week, uh, as we turn towards the teaching about uh, the cross and what the cross means in our lives, uh, we have the raising of Lazarus. And each one of these, uh, unto itself, uh, teaches us more about who God is uh, than uh, th than we could get from from reading uh, most any commentary. Just read these stories again and again, uh, and you see uh, the depth of who Jesus is and who Jesus came to tell us God is. All this to say. Um, one of the things that I uh, talked about last week and I talked to our children about when we do the virtues of the month during school, uh, when we get to the virtue of respect, uh, that I think the best and clearest ways to understand respect uh, is breaking it down to its root. Of re, which means again, uh, and spectacle, or the word for spectacles, to see again. And each one of these gospels is encouraging us uh, to look again, uh, uh, to spectate again upon the story, upon the people in the story with God's eyes. Everyone sees Nicodemus as the religious leader who has all the answers. Yet in the dark of night, in the depth of his soul, he has more questions than answers, and he's hungry for something that truly feeds him. God sees that. Putting on God's lens Lenses, the woman who is married five times, who has to go in the middle of the day uh, to draw water, understands the heart of God, the compassion of God, the forgiveness of God, the grace of God uh, more than anyone. And to God, this is not only a beloved child, but someone who has particular gifts and experiences to carry the gospel. With God's glasses on, this is a disciple, an evangelist. Now we get to the story of the blind man, who, wearing God's eyes, we realize is one of the few people that truly see. So let's go to the story. And before we go there, I have to tell you, I will never be able to read this story again uh, without uh, going back to my experience uh, that you all made possible in May of last year of going to the Holy Land. And I talked about the fact that uh, most of my most... Uh, Visceral experiences of God came from the natural landscape. Uh, very few of the incredibly ornate churches uh, 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 touched my soul. Uh, they were gorgeous, uh, but they didn't quite evoke the sense that God was here uh, as much as the natural landscape. And one exception of that uh, was the Pool of Siloam. Uh, partly because it was only discovered in 2004, so they hadn't been able to put a huge uh, uh, tower over it and marble it up, and uh, it really was as it had been. Uh, and the funny thing about it uh, is that it's only about half of the pool, uh, because uh, half of it uh, is on Greek Orthodox land, and so you get halfway through the Pool of Siloam, which has this incredible story that takes place here, uh, and then you have a chain link fence with a whole bunch of uh, uh, a shrubbery growing up around it. Uh, and because they couldn't figure out a, a solution to the dispute between the two churches, somehow the church uh, is able to uh, hinder our ability to truly uh, 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 connect with God. Uh, you know, but it was somewhat of a telling uh, irony. But there's this pool uh, that is incredibly uh, restored. Uh, it is as it was. I mean, it's just a flat uh, pool, and you can just picture this is where, uh, where this man went down to be healed. And I have to say... Uh, 
This guy drew the short straw when you think of the healing stories. And all of the healing stories have far more going on than just the magic of Jesus being able to heal. Pay attention to the details. Uh, remember the, uh, the hemorrhaging woman, what she had to do to receive uh, her healing? She just grabbed the hem uh, of, of, of Jesus' uh, cloak uh, and was healed. Jesus makes this gentleman go the long way. His healing involves Jesus taking a whole bunch of dirt, spitting in it, rubbing it together, rubbing that mud and spit all over uh, his eyes, and then that's not enough. He sends him uh, to the pool of Siloam, which means sent. It seems like kind of a convoluted way to heal for somebody who can heal just by touching their cloak. But I think there is a lot going on here. One, what's the first thing that the disciples say when they came upon this man? Do you remember the very first thing the disciples said when they came upon this blind man? Who sinned? They didn't say, did this guy screw up? They already presumed that. They said, who sinned? Did this man sin or did his parents sin or his grandparents sin? Who sinned that he ended up a blind man that we don't have to pay any attention to, that we don't even know how much uh, uh, about what he looks like, that when he's healed, we can't even identify him? Who sinned so that we can ignore this guy? Was it him or was it his grandparents? And Jesus says, neither. But this is an opportunity for God's glory to be revealed. And instead of making him just touch the hem, he, one, empowers him to be part of his own healing, and two, says you matter. There's something incarnational, there's something human about Jesus touching him, stopping what he's doing, rubbing that dirt uh, and that spit, and taking something of Jesus and rubbing it in his eyes and saying you matter enough to, to, uh, to rub the dirt in his eyes and saying, you go finish the healing story. You go to the Pool of Siloam, which means sent, because you are going to be sent out into the world. And then he comes back. And when he comes back, he's examined several times over. They hardly know what he looks like. It's sort of like Clark Kent and Superman or, 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 or Supergirl. And you know, how do they not know that this is the guy that they've been walking past for years and years in a small town? Uh, but for some reason, they've looked over him or past him uh, because they haven't had to honor him uh, in the full person that he is. And they've been able to uh, uh, forgive themselves because this person's responsible for their own uh, despair. Uh, so we don't even have to pay that much attention to him. It's not our responsibility. Uh, it must be God, God's punishment to this person. Uh, so they've looked over him, and uh, he's there, and he's healed. And they're, they're, they're questioning. The zone towns people are saying, aren't you the guy that, uh, that was blind? He said, yes, but now I see. And they say, that's not possible. Uh, and they keep challenging him. So then they go and get the Pharisees, uh, and they, uh, they challenge him some more. And they say, aren't you the guy who was blind? He said, yes. And he said, well, now you see. And they say, that's not possible. Uh, and then wasn't it on the Sabbath? And he says, yes. Um, and then they go, and they uh, ask the parents. Uh, and they say, uh, is that your son? And they say, yes. And they say, well, is it true that he was blind? Yes. Is it true that he sees now? Yes. And they say, so who healed him? And now the parents are getting nervous because they realize the more that they say can uh, get them in trouble. Uh, and so I love how the parents do this. They say, you know what? He's of age. Ask him. We've said all we're going to say. <laughs> he can speak for himself. Ask him. And they kind of excuse themselves. And I love the way that the blind man kind of says very plainly, uh, you're the one who taught me. You are the religious leaders. You're the one who taught me that if you are faithful to God, God will listen to you. And if you are not of God, if you're not faithful to God, if you don't follow God, God won't listen to you. So all I can tell you is that this man took me who was blind and gave me some. You all do the rest of the problem solving. I'm a simple man. You all are the religious leaders. I was blind. This guy who you say is a sinner was able to rub mud in my eyes and now I can see. And if that's not of God, then I don't quite understand the rest of what you've told me. And so they're more and more frustrated. And we start to realize that the blind man is about the only one in the story who can see clearly. And then he encounters Jesus and Jesus starts to ask him, did you know who the son of man is? Uh, and in the process of that, uh, it gets into this, uh, this exchange about what it is to truly be able to see. And then he truly is sent to share the word of God, to share his experience because he's experienced grace. He's experienced transformation. He's gone from being blind to being able to see. Uh, and in his ability to see clearly, uh, he's called to evangelize to those who can see fine uh, but can't see at all. 
And so when we put all these stories together, we get a sense not only of who God is uh, and how God cares for each and every one of us, uh, but we get a call of how we might be sent, of what it might be for us to walk that journey of faith. So I encourage you to take this home with you. Uh, look over the other Gospels because they're all so rich and so loaded. Uh, and as we get closer and closer, uh, two weeks from now, we're at Palm Sunday. And as we get closer to that cross, that journey to the cross, uh, may these stories let us know uh, the kind of love that we're walking towards and the kind of discipleship we're called to lead. Amen.